Everyone, welcome. So uh, I was supposed to be interviewed by a friend of mine, Kevin Roos, who had some travel issues, so I'm now interviewing myself. <laughs> and so I decided to ask the question that's been on my mind, my wife's mind, for, for quite some time. Andrew, how do you come up with such innovative ideas? It's like, well, I'm glad you asked. A lot of people ask me that. Um, <laughs> So um, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, how many of you know a lot about universal basic income? Raise your hand if you know a lot. And then do nothing if you know nothing. All right, most of you don't, don't know much. Well, you are here today, so you're what I call UBI curious. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I seem to be something uh, of a resource for people who are UBI curious. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my arc, uh, my journey, why I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is running for president as a Democrat in 2020. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and then we'll take some questions, and then I'd like to reserve the last 10, minute, 10 minutes or so just to take selfies and meet people individually, because I think it's really obnoxious to be in this setting and be talking from a stage and then like dash off. And unfortunately, so ordinarily I stick around for a long time, but I have a rally in Austin a little bit later tonight, um, and so I can't, because the traffic's murder and the rest of it, and so my team's like, you must leave relatively promptly, and so I was like, all right, I got it. So we're gonna take the last 10, 15 minutes or so just to schmooze it up. Um, so we've got, I guess, an hour together. I'll do my thing, talk for not that long, and then we'll take some questions, have what I hope is a lively discussion, and then uh, hopefully even meet individually. Um, so, so someone who knows nothing about universal basic income, what got you to come and devote a very important hour of your South by Southwest? You could be exposed to myriad experts from fields, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, why would you choose this forum? Like, what made you come here? Anyone want to just raise their hand and... Uh, say it's like what got them in here? Yes, miss. I'm worried about people. Wow, I love that. What's your name? Polly. Yeah, so Polly's worried about people. Raise your hand if you're worried about people. <laughs> wow, I love it. This is a group um, that has your collective head on straight because I too am worried about people. I am, uh, the, and the numbers are more horrifying the more you go in. The deeper you go into this space, the more worried you get. I have yet to encounter someone who's a deep expert in AI and the rest of it. It's like, yeah, things will be all right. <laughs> like, that's not the conversation you have, unfortunately. Like, if you, they know a lot, they'd be like, yo, it's, it's deeper and hairier than anyone thinks. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. So, um, so I'll give you my background and story uh, just to uh, lead you in, on the progression that I had. Uh, because I was here at South by Southwest several years ago speaking as the CEO of my organization, Venture for America. Uh, so. I started an organization called Venture for America to help train entrepreneurs around the country and generate job growth. Because I was very sad, circa 2010 and 11, in the wake of the financial crisis, I thought one of the key problems was that we had so much energy and human capital and financial capital heading to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and management consulting firms and not building generative businesses in Detroit or San Antonio or Baltimore or Cleveland or St. Louis. So I quit my job. I donated 120000 to start this new organization, Venture for America. Um, and then I started calling rich friends and asked them, do you love America? And then the smart among them said, what does it mean if I say yes? And then I said, uh, and I said at least $10,000. And then, then 12 of them were like, I love America for 10000 I was like, I thought you did. So, um, so we had a budget of 240000 that first year. Today, Venture for America's budget is around $6 million, thousands of Applicants, hundreds of fellows, generated several thousand jobs around the country. How many of you all like documentary films? How many of you have access to a Netflix password? So there's, a, so there's a, a, a documentary on Netflix right now about my organization called Generation Startup that follows six young entrepreneurs for a year and a half as they try and build businesses in Detroit. So that's what I've been doing for the last six and a half years. Uh, and then in 2016, Donald Trump became our president. Uh, and I was stunned by this. Uh, I said, wow, this is a terrible, terrible sign. Uh, and I started digging into why he won. And keep in mind, I'd spent the last six and a half years working in the Midwest and the South in places that had lost tons of manufacturing jobs. And so I looked at the data and the research, and I found that 
We'd automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. And if you look at the voter district data, there's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial robots in a voting district and the movement towards Trump. It's like a straight line. And so then, how many of you all work in technology or a technology adjacent field? Like a bunch of you. So we all have friends who are working on this stuff, we know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we will now do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and the lawyers and the accountants, the bookkeepers, the radiologists. So Polly, when you said you were worried about people, is this why you were worried about people? Yeah, I feel like they're People are having a hard time. Uh, and, and one of the messages I have is like, it's not immigrants that are making it so that people are having a hard time. It's the fact that we're making it so that human labor is less and less central to the economy. Where now it's more normal to have two, three jobs. 94% of the new jobs created since 2005 in the US have been gig temporary or contractor jobs. And so when I was digging into the numbers, I said, okay, it turns out that Donald Trump's election directly linked to the fact that we're decimating manufacturing jobs and we're just gonna keep cycling through these other occupations. And then when I started doing research for my book, now out on paperback, more on our people. <laughs> but uh, when I started doing research for my book, uh, the, the data just got bleaker and bleaker around human beings. Where, how many of you knew that America's life expectancy has declined for the last three years? Uh, and, and why is that? Opioids and suicides. Uh, but both of those have now overtaken vehicle deaths as causes of death in the US. You all want to know the last time America's life expectancy declined three years in a row? The Spanish flu, 1918. Uh, it's an anomaly in a developed country. It is not actually normal for your life expectancies to go down in a developed country. It's almost unheard of. Uh, and so it's not just that. Our labor force participation rate right now is at 63.2%, close to a multi-decade low in the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. No knock in those countries, but still not like where you would want to be if you're an industrialized nation. Oh, almost one in five prime working age American men hasn't worked in a year. And this is year 10 of an expansion. These are supposed to be like the best times you get, more or less. Uh, and so the data to me was shockingly consistent with the narrative of an automation wave that we're in the third inning of. Um, and the fourth and fifth and sixth innings are gonna be devastating. How many of you all have friends who are working on artificial intelligence or AI related companies? Like most all of you. So there are some themes here. Polly's worried about people and a lot of you work in tech um, and uh, know people who are working in tech. And again, the more you know, the more concerned you get. The more you're like, wow, uh, do I think that AI can outperform a call center worker who makes $14 an hour? Yeah, I do. You know, most of you are like, yeah, sure. What's the time frame on that? Now, two years from now, there are two and a half million call center workers in the United States making 14 bucks an hour. What percentage of Americans graduate from college today? It's 32. Uh, so if you include two years in associate's degrees, two year programs, it's 42. So if you think about the workforce, 58% are high school graduates making uh, typically between 14 and $15 an hour. So what you think about American jobs, you should think about lots and lots of high school grads. Uh, the most common jobs in the US economy are administrative and clerical work, including call center workers, retail, food service and food prep, truck driving and transportation. Being a trucker is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truck drivers in this country. 94% male, average age 49, average education high school or one year of college, a lot of them ex-military. Um, this is going to sound very politician-y, but I was just with a trucker in Iowa last week, <laughs> last month. Um, I mean, I, I, I was. Yeah, why Iowa indeed? Mystery. I'm actually going there again on Monday for the ninth time. And, uh, and, and so you look at it and say, okay, there are three and a half million truck drivers. Are we pretty confident that we're going to have robot trucks on the highways in five to ten years? Sure, they'll be on the road. I mean, they're on the road now. Like, they're actually testing robot trucks now. Are you going to have a robot truck maybe with a human there, like, twiddling their thumbs as, like, a quote-unquote fail-safe? Like, maybe. But eventually, are you going to start thinking, huh, maybe I can convoy some trucks together, get a human in the first one, and then a couple of robot trucks following right behind? Like, that's pretty reasonable. 
you know, and, and so, so you can start seeing where this is going to go. Dozens of truckers recently protested in Indianapolis. They did something called a slow roll, which they had a bunch of trucks, and then they just started driving their trucks slowly on the highway. Gums up traffic. What were they protesting? They were protesting the electronic monitoring of their driving time and work shifts. How do you think they're going to react when it's a robot truck that's actually taking the job away? I'm going to suggest they're not going to take that well. Uh, right now, the average trucker, trucker makes uh, a little less than $50,000 a year. And it's one of the higher paying jobs for a high school grad in this country. What's their next economic alternative going to be when the robot trucks come? It's a rhetorical question. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Now, I studied economics in college, uh, and what my textbook said would happen if you were to lose, let's say, four million manufacturing jobs. Who here studied economics? Someone did. So what did your textbook say would happen? Retrain, reskill, higher productivity work, economy grows all as well, right? You remember that from macroeconomics that you've got to be in and then <laughs> forgot? That's fine. Um, I got an A. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so that is what the macroeconomics textbook says. And then uh, it turns out in real life, uh, when you go look at the numbers of what happened to the manufacturing workers in Michigan or, or Indiana, uh, 40 to 44 percent of them left the workforce and were never heard from again. Now, how do they survive? About half of that group filed for disability. Uh, there are now more Americans on disability than work in construction. 20 percent of working age adults in some parts of the country. And if you go to these communities, you can see it. There are just a lot of people on disability. Now, are they genuinely disabled? Yeah, a lot of them had genuine injuries because if you're working in a manufacturing plant for you know 12 years, like you probably have something messed up. Um, but in, like, would they prefer to be working? Like in most cases, yeah. Um, and so what happened to the manufacturing workers is almost certain to happen to the truckers. You know, it's like there is going to be no magical realignment. You're not going to take 500,000 middle-aged men and turn them into coders or whatever ridiculous fantasy <laughs> someone is peddling. Um, and 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 the, the other aspect of it too is that. It's like, why on earth do you think you're supposed to try and turn a truck driver into a software engineer? Like, reflect on that for a moment. And the reason is that we define ourselves by economic value at this point. It's like, if you don't have any economic value, then we have to turn you into something that does, even if it makes no sense in the world to think that we can do it. And when I went to Washington, D.C. with a set of issues, so you know, I'm a pretty cool guy. So like, I, I went to D.C. and was like, meeting with various legislators and policymakers, because I was an Obama appointee. I was an honorary ambassador of entrepreneurship. Uh, I have some stories to tell. But <laughs> what can I tell? I'll tell a stupid story just because I, I found it funny. So, um, so I'm in the White House with Daniel Lubetsky, the CEO of Kind. Um, kind bars, you know, little snacks. And then someone's like, I'm hungry. And then I, I kid you not, he like opens his jacket like this, like he's Batman. And he has like kind bars like all over. Like he must have had a custom jacket made with like eight extra pockets. So he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and they're, they're flavors you've never seen or heard of and never seen or heard of again. It wasn't like, here's like an almond apricot. No, it was like some weird flavors. Anyway, so. <laughs> And then I was the only person who brought my wife. I was like, how, the rest, how did the rest of you stay married? Like, this was just weird. I was like, here's my comms person. I was like, here's my wife. <laughs> I'm like, what are you guys doing? Anyway, um, so I'm a cool guy. So I'm meeting with various legislators in DC being like, guys, what are we going to do? We're in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the country. What is the plan? And what do you think they said to me when I said, what is the plan? <laughs> There's no plan. <laughs> it looked at me like I, had a, I was speaking another language. The responses I got were, we can't talk about that. We should study that. And we must educate and retrain Americans for the jobs of the future. And then I said, guys, I looked at the studies. Do you all want to guess how effective government-funded retraining programs are? 15%. Yes, zero to 15 percent. Uh, we're terrible at it. And so then when I said, we're terrible at that, then the legislator would be like, well, I guess we're going to get better at it then. And then they'd just go back to their lunch. And I'd just be like, holy shit. Like, is this what passes for thinking, uh, you know, like at, at this point? Are we so far gone as a country that we're not even reckoning with the fundamental changes that are devastating our communities? 
Yeah, yeah, that's where we are. That's totally where we are. So then I go home, I'm steeped in this knowledge, this certainty, this dread. And keep in mind, I'm one of the most celebrated social entrepreneurs of this generation. I get medals, awards, accolades, like for being the guy who created thousands of jobs around the country. And I am 100% certain that my work, as proud as I am of it, was pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. And no one's gonna do a damn thing about the giant hole. So then I went home and was like, okay, like what is the plan? What are we going to do? And I have two young kids who are six and three, and uh, so literally, like, I'm looking at them being like, am I really just gonna raise them in this country that's gonna disintegrate around them and just like start trying to sock money away so that we can like have a bunker like some of my richer friends? Like, is that really the plan? And that struck me as deeply uh, pathetic as a plan. And so I said, okay, what is the actual plan? Like, what am I going to do? And then I thought, well, in order to make it so that the people that Polly uh, is worried about like that the people will do better. You have to actually redesign our economy. You have to like change the rules so that we don't value ourselves solely as economic inputs, but we value ourselves intrinsically. Like maybe we're worth something even if our truck starts driving itself, or the AI is better than us at reading the radiology film, or you know my mall closes and like I'm a you know 39 year old woman who works in the mall. So we have to start looking at valuing ourselves at some other mechanism than the marketplace, because the marketplace is about to turn on us in epic, catastrophic fashion. And so I was like, okay, how do you make that happen? And so then I looked and said, well, the only way to rewrite the rules of the economy is to get control of the government. And I said, okay, how do you get control of the government? You run for president and win. And then I said, okay, what are the rules for running for president? Only two rules, it turns out. Uh, 35 or older, and natural born citizen. So I was like, check and check. And, and, then I, and then I was like, and then check number three is I went to my wife, I was like, hey baby, I think I'm gonna run for president. <laughs> and then she was like, <laughs> she was like, that's nice, like, you know, pass the sauce. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's how I came to run for president on a platform of universal basic income, which is that we have to start putting $1,000 a month in the hands of American adults as soon as possible, which would enable tens of millions of people to make effective transitions. And as a parent, what excited me the most about this was that the data very clearly shows it makes children healthier and stronger, it improves nutrition, it improves graduation rates, it improves mental health, it improves relationships, domestic violence goes down, hospital visits go down. It actually just makes life better for people. If you're interested in female empowerment, there are millions of American women who right now are in exploitative or abusive jobs or relationships or are doing work that is unrecognized by the market. Uh, like my wife. My wife is at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic, and what does the market value her work at? Zero, unfortunately. You know, she gets the big uh, goose egg. Uh, GDP, the same thing. When I know she's working much harder and doing more important work than uh, certainly like I, you know, like um, the average hedge fund analyst or whatever it is. Um, and so we have all of these perversions baked into our valuation of ourselves based upon what the market says is important or valuable. And so you create this universal basic income, which is not my idea. Uh, Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King championed it whole, like full on the last year of his life in 1967 before he was killed. Milton Friedman and a thousand economists signed a study saying this would be great for the economy and it passed the House of Representatives twice under Richard Nixon in 1971. Came this close to being law. It's called a family assistance plan. Would have guaranteed everyone a minimum income. Uh, and the reason it didn't pass was that Democrats in the Senate wanted a higher income threshold. And then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where everyone in that state now gets between one and $2,000 a year. And what state is that? And how do they fund it? And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology, that's right. I've heard marijuana, I've heard a lot of things on that one. <laughs> but it is technology. And now I'm going around the country saying, look, what they're doing in Alaska with oil money, we can do for everyone with technology money. As a matter of fact, we don't have a choice but to start moving this direction because if we follow GDP and capital efficiency, we're gonna follow it off a cliff, which we are doing right now. We're in the middle of it. Donald Trump is not business as usual. Donald Trump is a sign of disintegration. 
and the disintegration is accelerating. You can see it in any numerical measurement. Life expectancy, mental health, uh, deaths of despair, like any measurement you want, business formation, marriage, child rearing, all of them. Historic lows, multi-decade lows, moving for a new job, multi-decade low. Pretty much any measurement of healthfulness you can find in America is at a multi-decade low or a record low right now. We are falling apart. And so this is a necessary, this is an overdue move. Like this should have happened decades ago, but here we are, it's 2019 and we have to make it happen now. So that's universal basic income. Put a thousand bucks a month in the hands of every American adult. Now some of you are thinking like, ha ha, that sounds great, but isn't that way too much money for us to afford? Who's thinking that? Raise your hand. Anyone? No one? Wow, that'd be great. At least a few people are like, hey, that's like three trillion dollars. Um, now, what's amazing is that it gets actually very, very affordable very fast. For context, the economy is at, at 20 trillion dollars, up five trillion in the last 12 years. So we're at like massive levels of wealth. Uh, and instead of costing three trillion dollars a year, it actually costs more like 1.8 trillion because we're already spending 1.5 trillion on income support, 126 welfare programs, social security and other things that end up just bringing the cost down of guaranteeing everyone a thousand dollars a month. So what I referenced before about this technology money, you all saw the headlines where Amazon paid zero in taxes last year despite record profits, right? And I'm going to suggest that's not Amazon's fault, that's our fault. Like if you're Amazon's management team, you're like high-fiving, you're like, yes, another, another year of zero taxes. Well done. Give those tax lawyers a bonus. Um, and that's cool. That's what they should do. That's what they're supposed to do. But what we're supposed to do is say, hey, we have to have a system that you can't just freaking game that easily. Uh, we need to get the American public a slice of all of that economic innovation that's happening because the trap we're in right now, who are going to be the big winners from AI and the rest of it? Who wins? The biggest tech companies, right? You know any promising AI that's going to buy anyway because they're worth a trillion dollars. You come up with a promising AI company, they're going to buy you for two billion uh, and then just going to tack you on. So the big winners are the Amazons and Googles and Facebooks and Ubers of the world and they're great at not paying a whole lot of tax. Uh, and so what we have to do is we have to have a tax that they can't game their way out of. And so if you look around the world, every other advanced economy already has a value added tax, uh, which is very hard to game. And so if we adopted a value added tax at even half the European level, it generates 800 billion in new revenue, uh, which combined with current spending, all the economic growth that would happen. Imagine if you all walked out of here with an extra thousand bucks a month. Uh, you know, I, I, I dare say your local economies would be a little bigger. <laughs> you'd be like, excellent. Um, pizza on me or, or you know, whatever it is you, you do uh, later tonight. Uh, but multiply that times everyone in the economy, you get hundreds of billions in new tax revenue. You save hundreds of billions on things like incarceration, uh, homelessness services, emergency room health care. And then you also generate hundreds of billions of dollars by having a healthier, stronger, mentally healthier, more productive, more entrepreneurial, more creative population. This thing will pay for itself. Uh, this is called the trickle up economy from human beings, families and communities up. What do you think? The trickle up economy, the human centered economy. So that is the game plan. That is my plan to save humanity. And ordinarily I have a slide, I don't always have it, but I have like pictures of my family up and uh, if you look at my little boys' faces, you will see they are not very tough little boys. They're very, very not tough. <laughs> uh, and so I'm doing this to keep the country strong and whole so that they can grow up not tough, if you know what I mean. Uh, and so that is the plan. Um, so hopefully I've answered some of the questions you might have had about universal basic income and the main idea. Big gist, if someone asks you what's universal basic income, you just say it's a policy where everyone in a society gets a certain amount of money, no questions asked, and most of the policies are around the same level I'm proposing, which is $1,000 per month per adult. So that's what it is. Why to do it? Because our economy is being transformed in ways that are going to displace millions of American workers and it's already happening. Can we afford it? Yes. Will it cause inflation? No. Is it awesome? Yes. Is anyone trying to make it happen? Yeah, that guy. And, uh, and then now hopefully all of you too. Um, so we'd love to take some questions from you all, but I'm going to suggest too, the reason, if you came here because you're worried about people, you are right to be worried because this economy is going to go from punitive to savage pretty quickly. The next downturn, the knives are going to come out. Like I've been a CEO, you don't fire people when times are normal, but when times get tough, you, you like just look around and see who's not nailed down. 
And even if they're nailed down, you start looking for a nail remover. So in the next downturn, it is going to be savage, and we have to get our shit together between now and then. Uh, so if we don't, if we don't fight for it, none of this will happen on its own. I've been to DC. I've seen the machinery. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about too. Like no one's going to do a damn thing. So we are going to have to do it for ourselves. In entrepreneurial circles, there are two mindsets. One is someone else will take care of this, and the other is I'm going to take care of it. And we all know that this is something that no one else is going to take care of. So thank you all very, very much. We'd love to take questions. I think there's a mic for you. Thank you all. Hi. Um, my question is, it sounds a lot like socialism. How are you going to prevent that message from changing from your vision to what we all know is going to come? Uh, yeah, so I was asked that on Fox last week, and I said, uh, this is capitalism where income doesn't start at zero. Uh, and having money is actually good for business, good for the consumer economy, good for markets. It helps us all participate in markets, and I'm a CEO and business person. I love capitalism. Um, and that seems to work. Uh, I think it's something about my manner that makes me seem really capitalist or something. <laughs> where they're like, where, where they're like, this guy does not seem like a socialist at all. Uh, so that, that, that response has gone, been pretty effective so far. Yeah, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And you've weaved together two things here that are actually very different, which is universal income and taxing the thing that's working technology. Like, technology is something that's working best for us. Why would you go out to destroy that when that's what's actually working? That's where whatever jobs are going to be provided are most likely to come from if you don't run it all offshore with your tax policy. Yeah. So the, I, I'd suggest that there's a monumental difference between a relatively mild tax that even my techie friends agree with um, and destruction. Uh, and so when I talk to my friends in Silicon Valley, and I'm friends with many of them, and I say, hey, guys, um, you're probably automating away all the major jobs. They're like, yes, we are. Uh, and then I'm like, how do you feel about it? And they're like, not great. Uh, and then I say, how would you like to take a bit of a haircut and make it so that the truckers don't necessarily riot and you don't need to go live in the bunker? And then they say, deal. And these are the CEOs of the tech companies. They are not inhuman. They're Americans, they're parents, they're patriots. And they know that it's a much better climate for progress and innovation if people actually feel like progress is working for them. So if they think that, I would say that they know what they're talking about. Hi. I've heard a lot of your talks um, about implementing this, and obviously the struggles are to get it implemented. But how do you protect it? Say we actually do get UBI implemented. How do you make sure that the next regime doesn't come along and rip it away? Because if people get that money and they start to spin it, they'll be spread too thin to live without it. Well, what I'm inspired by is the experience in Alaska, which is a deeply conservative state. It was passed by a Republican governor. And it's wildly popular in Alaska. So that's one of the great things about universality, is that if I say there's this program and you're like, oh, someone else gets that, then maybe you don't like it. But if this is something that everyone is getting, as is the case in Alaska, so if you check out what's going on in Alaska, it's been in effect for 37 years across many, many different administrations. And it's so popular in Alaska, which is a deep red conservative state, that a majority, a vast majority of Alaskans said they would accept higher taxes to preserve the dividend. So if there's something, because right now, the, those of us, you know, liberal, progressive, conservative, we still have this sinking feeling that if the money goes to the government, it just gets sunk into some like bureaucracy and pipe and we'll never see it again. Um, but if it's money that comes into your hands, then you're like, wow, this is something the government actually did right. And then if I say, hey, I'm going to take it away, you're like, what are you talking about? That's like the only thing you guys do well. And, and then everyone else would be like, yeah, that's the only thing you guys do well. Like it's literally like everyone's favorite thing. So this is what happened in Alaska, and that's what's going to happen in the whole US of A after I'm president and make this happen. 